This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. It's the end of the year and time for our annual mini stories episodes. We have three episodes this year cresting over the new year because we have so many stories. Since these are always fan favorites, I didn't think you'd mind if we stretched out a bit. If you're new to this, the mini stories are a hodgepodge of fun, quick hit stories that probably came up in our research for another episode, or maybe it was just some cool thing that someone told us about that we found really interesting, but we knew from doing a little bit of research, they didn't warrant a full episode and two months of hard reporting and interviews, but they're great 99PI stories nonetheless. The best part, from from my perspective, is that we do them as unscripted interviews where I get to chat with the reporters who work on the show. Sometimes I know a little bit about what they're talking about, like we pitch them in a meeting, but sometimes I know nothing. They keep them from me, and that's very fun. This week, we have stories about movie novelizations, Swiss defensive architecture, Central Park lampposts, and the outlandish costumes of the Swedish supergroup, ABBA. I mean, there's no way you can hear that list and not listen, right? Stay with us. Up first is producer Chris Berube. So I'm here with producer Chris Berube. Hey, Chris. Hey, Roman. How you doing? I'm, I'm doing pretty good. How about you? I'm well. I'm glad we are doing our mini stories chat. It I is, love mini stories. It's the most wonderful time of the year, the mini stories. <laughs> uh, partly because it is a less formal chat with you because I miss coming to Oakland and just having some time where we see each other in person and we can have our movie talks. Right, exactly, exactly. We have to make do with movie talks on the Slack channel that's called uh, Movie. What is it called? Is it Movie Club? Movie Club. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's, it doesn't have quite the same effect. Well, okay, so <laughs> I have decided to import our movie talks into mini stories. Perfect. So specifically, I want to talk about a quarantine hobby that I have taken up. I've been reading a lot of movie novelizations, so... Roman, do you remember movie novelizations? Uh, sure. Um, you, you know, the ones I find funniest are ones that are like these action blockbusters that are the novelization of, I don't know, Transformers Dark Side of the Moon or something. Sure. Like that. And, and you think, why would anyone read that thing? <laughs> yeah, Speed, the official movie novelization. <laughs> exactly, that kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. It's funny. There's actually this really rich history to movie novelizations. So they go back to pretty much the beginning of movies. So huh. as soon as people started making movies... The producers realized, you know, we could turn a quick buck if we make a book that is based on the movie. But they really took off in the 1970s when blockbuster films started becoming a thing. So you had okay. Indiana Jones and Star Wars and all these movies coming out. Huh. And some of those tie-ins were actually bestsellers, like they made the bestseller chart. Wow. If, I guess if you put yourself back in that headspace, it makes a lot of sense. Like back in the 70s, you had to go see a movie in a theater or not there was no home viewing like you had to just wait until it came out on tv <laughs> right or you right. could get the movie novelization if you wanted to relive the movie so it's kind of like if you wanted to quote unquote watch the movie at home you bought a novelization exactly like this is the one way that you could relive it and revisit those characters and think about the movie again that actually makes a ton of sense i, I like that yeah yeah, but that doesn't explain uh, in this moment of streaming every type of video content that's ever existed mm -hmm. um, why you are reading them right now. <laughs> True, I could watch Star Wars if I wanted to watch Star Wars. That option is available to me. Um, so I started getting really interested in these because of the generic product episode that we made. So do you remember the generic branding episode? Of course, it's a, it's an instant <laughs> classic. Everyone loved it. <laughs> especially your canadian brethren <laughs> it was the, it was the most canadian episode of 99 pi we've had so you may recall one of the people we spoke to for that episode was a guy named terry bisson who was the editor of this series of generic books this was like yeah. a footnote in the story but yeah but it's a very memorable footnote it totally is so just refresh your memory here's terry talking about uh, the no frills books that he helped edit I thought of it as a satire on publishing if you could have no frills cornflakes why couldn't you have a no frills romance? So I did this interview with Terry and we're talking and he's actually this really fascinating guy. So he's a really well-regarded sci-fi writer uh -huh. and we were talking about his career and he mentions that for a while he used to write movie novelizations as a way to make some cash. So he did some pretty big movies actually like Johnny Mnemonic, the Keanu Reeves movie. He did Galaxy Quest. Uh, he oh, did cool. a Bruce yeah. Willis sci-fi movie that you may remember called <laughs> The Fifth Element. Oh, of course. And you remember that movie. It was about 95 or something like that when it came out. And it sold really well. 
I think the reason it sold was because people thought, well, maybe the book will explain what's going on in the movie because there was a lot of stuff in the movie that didn't make sense. And they thought maybe I would make sense out of it, but I, I didn't even try. <laughs> so I'm talking to Terry, we're talking about his career and I'm saying, wow, it's really cool that you got to see these movies before anybody else. And Terry tells me something really surprising, and that is he never saw the movies. <laughs> well, that is surprising. <laughs> How is that possible? Well, he might have seen the movie after it came out, but he didn't get to see the movie while he was writing the book. It's usually done uh, while the movie is either still being done or is in post-production. And at the last minute, they thought, look, we'll spend 20 grand and it promotes the the movie a little bit. So because of the production schedules, Terry said in his experience, it was always based off the script and not the actual movie when you're doing the novelization. Wow. I mean, I guess that makes sense now that you lay it out. But it is truly weird to think about that these novelizations haven't connected to the actual visual part of the movie at all. Right. I was actually like a little bit skeptical when he told me this. I'm like, how do you write a novelization of a movie with no movie? So Terry, after we had our generics talk, he connected me with a friend of his named Liz Hand, who's another sci-fi writer who wrote a number of these novelizations. And she pretty much confirmed everything that Terry said. Like she did 12 Monkeys. She did the X-Files movie. And she said, yeah, all you ever get is the script. I did six or seven novelizations. And with one exception... I know, did not see a film. As you've been reading these and doing a little bit of this research, what does it mean for the person writing the novelization to have not seen the movie? So what it means is that the novelization will have a lot of detail that is different from the movie just (laughs) because of how movies are made. So think about it. I mean, part of the issue is that stuff will change from the script while you're making the movie. So, (laughs) (laughs) you know, an actor comes up with a new line or some special effects are too expensive to film. Terry was telling me actually when he was writing the Galaxy Quest book, they kept changing the ending. They kept rewriting the damn script and they probably had these um, groups that told them what ending they liked and stuff like that i had to rewrite the last um, 10 and 15 pages of it three or four times what terry's describing which is like he would go back in and rewrite it to match the movie that was kind of rare that often did not happen huh. so with a lot of these novelizations changes got made and the producers just wouldn't bother to tell the writer who's doing the <laughs> novel so there's all of these examples of movie novelizations where there are details that are wrong compared to the movie. Mm-hmm. So Roman, for example, I assume you've seen E.T., the extraterrestrial. Sure, I did, yes. One of the most popular movies ever. <laughs> um, now you remember there's a scene in E.T. where Elliot, the little kid, is trying to lure out E.T. and he's using candy. With the Reese's Pieces, yeah. Yeah, it's it's super famous. So in the novel, it's M&M's because they hadn't <laughs> struck a deal with Reese's Pieces yet. <laughs> So another example is The Empire Strikes Back, the novelization of that. In the novel, Yoda is blue. (laughs) If you had to describe Yoda, first thing you say is he's a green Green dude. Like he's (laughs) Hall of Fame green thing. If there was a Hall of Fame for stuff that is green, Yoda would be in there on the first ballot. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that thing happens quite a bit. There were like small changes that would get made. And ultimately, you know, that doesn't really ruin the experience of reading the book if it's still the same story. The other problem, though, is that screenplays aren't very detailed. So when you're reading a screenplay, there's just like a lot of gaps. The screenplay is like 120 pages, basically, of material, and it's all dialogue with a few set directions. You need a lot of filler. In a screenplay, it might say the characters walk into a room and you don't get any other details. So if you're the person writing the novelization, you have to fill in all these details of what the room looks like or what the characters are wearing, all these things you don't have access to. And sometimes the screenplay doesn't have details of very important stuff. (laughs) So Roman, one of my favorite movies is Alien, as you know. Sure, it's great. It's one of the best. Here's something that's funny about the screenplay for Alien. They don't describe the alien. (laughs) So what did they do when they had to do the novelization? So I found this old article about Alan Dean Foster who wrote the novelization and he says... He went to the studio and was like, 
hey, can I see the alien? And they said no. Oh, my God. Well, so what did he do? Well, there's a lot of passages in the novelization where you could see he's clearly trying to avoid getting specific <laughs> about it. So here's one. <clears throat> There was a vague suggestion of something tall and heavy. <laughs> and this is a bit later on. Above the helpless figure was a faint outline. Something man-shaped, but definitely not a man. Oh, wow. This is some real verbal gymnastics to not be specific there. That's pretty good, actually. And that novelization of Alien is seen as a classic of the genre. It was an actual bestseller. Right. But there are some cases where the writer is trying to fill in these details and add things and gets a little carried away, maybe. Give me an example of that. So an example of this that's pretty notorious is Jaws the Revenge, the fourth Jaws movie. And the writer added this whole backstory about why the shark in Jaws keeps chasing the same family. And the explanation is a voodoo curse. <laughs> I think in Jaws the Revenge, the shark follows Ellen Brody like down to the Bahamas or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, that is what happens. And clearly the person writing the novelization <laughs> which like took some inspiration. This is a yeah, leap sure. in logic that's a little too far, so I have to do something to explain it. Yeah. So uh, ancient curse is the easiest way to connect those dots. It makes as much sense <laughs> as anything else. And this kind of thing would happen when you were writing and you know you hit a, a book where you didn't know what to do. And Liz Hand gave me an example from her career where she had to do this. I won't say that, you know, the novelization of Catwoman is my finest moment, but it was a paycheck. <laughs> is, does she mean the, the Halle Berry movie, Catwoman? Yeah, so the Halle Berry Catwoman, kind of a notorious flop. I think it still has 9% on Rotten Tomatoes, Ooh. last I checked. Rough, yeah. What can I do for you? White Russian. No ice. Hold the vodka. Hold the Kahlua. Green, straight up. Liz was given the script for this and she looks at it and she realizes, oh no, like this is a mess. Like, what am I going to do? There's very little detail in here. How am I going to fill a book? So then how did she solve this problem? So get ready. The way she solved this problem is kind of amazing. So what I ended up doing, there was a character in the book, in the screenplay rather, who was a supporting character who was like a renowned catologist a supposed anthropologist, archaeologist who specialized in cats. And the Catwoman character would go periodically to visit this woman to ask for, you know, oh, help me, Obi Cat, tell me what to do with my little pointy ears. And, and so what I, I thought was like, okay, I know what I can do, even though this is totally out of line. Um, I'm just going to do it anyway. So I wrote three or four little cat I made up three or four little cat fables or fairy tales. And so each time the Catwoman character would go to see this woman, the action ground to a halt. I dropped these things in and basically they were filler, but for me they were fun. And actually one of these folk tales that Liz wrote turned out so well that she managed to get it published in a couple of short story anthologies, wow. including this one anthology of stories about cats, where it's a story by Stephen King a story by George R. R. Martin, and then also her short story that was originally in the Catwoman novelization. <laughs> that is so good. It's really funny. I mean, it's so interesting because a couple months ago, you know, I probably had the same thoughts that you did about movie novelizations. I thought, mm -hmm. oh yeah, these are cash-ins. These kind of seem like hack work. But the deeper you dig into them, the more you realize there's creativity here. They're kind of weird. They're kind of their own thing from the movies. And to me, that's a really interesting way to think about the original movie. And it kind of deepens the whole experience of being a fan. I mean, it's kind of beautiful. I, I, I really love it. Like people operating with you know, creativity in the sort of marginalia of this gigantic, you know, creative apparatus. It's it's so cool. I have a few special thank yous before we go. I want to thank my brother, Dan who is a big fan of these novelizations. He gave me some great advice for this story. Also, thank you to Justin Morris, who gave me uh, a great list of things to read to learn more about this. And thank you to the authors who are very serious science fiction writers who uh, indulged me and were very generous with their time talking about these footnotes in their careers. So thank you to Terry Bisson, Oakland's own Terry Bisson. And thank you very much to Liz Hand, her new book. It's a novel called The Book of Lamps and Banners. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roman.
One of the stories that came over the transom via Twitter this year is about the four-digit codes on the lampposts in Central Park in New York City. A person named Gloria at Lucent 508 tweeted about this clever form of wayfinding in the park, and I think like a hundred people said it to me. So each lamppost in the park has a four-digit number on it. The first two digits represent the closest cross street to the post in the 840-acre city park. So if the first two digits are 96, the post is parallel to 96th Street. The second two digits represent two things, which side the lamppost is on and its relative distance from the edge. If it is an even number, then it's on the east side of the park. So E even, E east. That's how I remember that. And an odd number means that that light is closer to the west side. The smaller the number, the closer it is to the edge. So for example, 9605 is roughly parallel to 96th Street, and it's pretty close to the west side because it has a small, odd number. But if a lamppost is numbered 9642, it's closer to the east side than is the west side, but because it has that high number 42, it's more towards the middle of the park. So if you ever get lost in Central Park, find a lamppost, read the embossed number, and you'll know roughly where you are. When the explanation for this code you know, found people on the internet, a lot of people were intrigued by it, but they often wondered, well, what good is this cool wayfinding method if nobody knows about it? Well, the answer is, it's not really wayfinding for us, for patrons of the park. It's really for park employees, whose job it is to replace and repair those lamps. But now that you know, you could like spin around with a blindfold on, set off in any direction, find a lamp, and know where you are in Central Park, which is pretty cool. Up next is the digital director of 99PI and the co-author of The 99% Invisible City, Kurt Kolstad. So if you know anything about the history of Switzerland, you probably know that it's a, a beautiful mountainous country and it has famously remained as neutral as possible when it comes to global conflicts. Kurt Kolstad is here to talk about how that stance has shaped the built environment of Switzerland, including you know, kind of obvious ways, but also really strange and furtive ways as well. Yes, Switzerland is filled with defensive architecture and infrastructure. And yes, some of it is pretty obvious. Like on the tops of some hills and mountains, you can find these rows of jagged concrete teeth just sticking up from the ground. <laughs> and some people call them Toblerone lines. <laughs> like the chocolate is that the is that yeah. I mean, that's another thing that Switzerland is famous for is that uh, spiky chocolate exactly and it's because of that you know jagged shape uh, but these are built up to stop incoming tanks from rolling over hillsides into Swiss territory so these like literally look like if you were to take one of those chocolate bars out of its package it's a piece of con- a big piece of concrete that just looks just like a Toblerone and, and yeah basically tanks. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's an example of a you know a kind of an obvious <laughs> defense of design what's it what's a more invisible design well i'll start with the one that sent me down this whole rabbit hole so a few years back the uh, swiss government decided to remove some explosives from an old bridge and that made the news so wait so they actually had explosives built into the bridge itself yes and that was my <laughs> reaction too i had the same question i was like <laughs> why why would you rig your own bridge with explosives and the bridge in question is an old one. It's 700 plus years old. But during the Cold War, they strapped TNT to this thing so that key supports could be detonated in case of invasion. Okay, so they removed those. Is is that tactic no longer a thing in Switzerland? Well, here's the thing. Switzerland won't actually comment on that for security (laughs) reasons. So it's possible that they're just done with that. But it's also Mm -hmm. possible they just swapped it out with new explosives. And this is just one part of the equation, right? So some bridges are also flanked with artillery, which is like hidden in the mountainside and works as like a backup system so they can retreat. And then if the enemy tries to repair the bridge, the Swiss can just rain fire down on them and stop them from doing it. (laughs) And so all of this is a way to like keep the enemies, you know, both from crossing the bridge and then from fixing the bridge in case they want to come back across. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So they got explosives to to detonate the bridge and uh, guns pointed down at them in case the enemy wants to repair that bridge if it's been detonated. So they have all kinds of things in, in, in their arsenal. 
Yes, totally. And secrecy and redundancy are a huge part of that. And mm -hmm. bridges are also just a small part of that. So in the Alps, for example, the government has carved out tens of thousands of bunkers and other installations over the decades. And they've also rigged explosives up in the mountains to trigger landslides. Again, a way of you know stopping or at least slowing down would be invaders. Mm -hmm. And then there are those little villages. And you know the ones I'm talking about. You see them on postcards. <laughs> so you mean like these Swiss hill towns with little picturesque cottages and, and some farm animals and uh, beautiful views. Uh, those are part of the defensive design? Not all of them, but yes. There's oh this God. whole subset of camouflage <laughs> designs, like anti-aircraft guns that are tucked behind these cute little windows in cozy looking <laughs> fake cottages. And the juxtaposition is crazy. Here, check out check out this link. <laughs> Just take take a look. Okay. Oh my goodness. There's like a big gun coming out of that cottage. <laughs> it is super strange, right? Like <laughs> Yeah. Whoa, that is really something. That's a Swiss gun right it there. It really know. is massive. It's something else. And what really is impressive to me, too, is the attention to detail on these things. So mm -hmm. in theory, these only really need to work at a distance, right? They're not made to be camouflaged up close. But nonetheless, they're really <laughs> skillfully painted. They even paint like fake shadows under the fake overhangs. You have to almost walk right up to one to see what they really are, or at least see what they're really not. So it sounds like this approach kind of pervades all kinds of things in terms of their defensive design, like it has effect on the architecture, the infrastructure. But, you know, is this a particularly Swiss thing? I mean, is this where this kind of thing started? Yeah. I mean, the Swiss have bunkers that, you know, date back to the 1800s, like most countries, but they got really worried and really serious about this stuff in the 1930s. <laughs> wonder why. <laughs> yeah, right? So, on the one hand, they had this relatively defensible, mountainous landscape. But on the other hand, they were completely surrounded by countries yeah. that, as it turned out, were on the brink of another world war. So, their preparations made sense. So, this kind of cropped up between those world wars. But um, you also mentioned the Cold War. So, it sounds like, you know, they got started, but then they saw kind of more of a need even after the Axis and Allies powers, you know, fought all around them. Right. That like confirmed their suspicion that they really right. needed this kind of defense. And so right. Switzerland wanted to be prepared for anything and to make guerrilla war as hard as possible on potential enemies. So among other things, they even built enough shelters to literally house the entire country's population, which... Huh. It's unprecedented. No other right. nation has done anything like this. And it even became a matter of policy to make sure every citizen had the right to access bunker space if they needed it. Well, that's really something. And then there's all this you know, self-destructive you know, design, the big red button that blows everything up. I mean, it's hard to imagine. Why have a button that destroys everything? Danger. The emergency destruct system is now activated. The ship will detonate in T-minus 10 minutes. What circumstance makes you decide to really go through with that? I mean, that's that's the crazy thing to me. And, and if you could imagine this from the point of view of an engineer, right? A Swiss engineer who is tasked with doing this. So they're building a bridge. They're building it to stand up and work as a bridge. But mm -hmm. they're simultaneously building it to blow up. Or to serve another function, right? Like uh, to be turned into a bunker or whatever. And mm -hmm. I actually read about this one bunker, for example, that is really just a railway tunnel that's used as a railway tunnel, but they've packed it with supplies. And the idea is that in an emergency, they can house 20,000 people in there and they'd blow up and cave in the two main entrances. So it's like a rail tunnel by day. And then if disaster strikes, it can be this huge like bunker that's carved into a mountain. The world has moved on like different. The Cold War has evolved in certain ways. Like, is, is this still a thing? Are they still making things like this? Like, this, is this just part of the Swiss mentality when it comes to building things to have this kind of defensive structures? I mean, it is in part. So they now have more publicly known structures and installations mm -hmm. and bases and things. But a lot of this stuff is still classified. And so it's hard to tell exactly how much. But, but you can see this 
shift in that they've started to sell off some of these places. So, you know, there's some bunkers that people have turned into houses and also these fake homes that once housed artillery are now in some cases becoming real homes that house people. (laughs) I like that. That's something that we wrote about in the book with uh, Toronto, the electric substations that were camouflaged as houses and then and the technology evolved past the point of needing these kind of converters, and and therefore those houses became actual houses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a it's a really strong parallel, and it's one of the reasons I was like, I thought about talking about this in the book, and that section was getting a little bit long on, yeah, on yeah. camouflage, so felt a little redundant. Pretend to be a thing long enough, maybe you'll grow up <laughs> to be that thing. Well, Pinocchio <laughs> becomes a real boy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. Thanks so much. We have one more mini story about the strange tax law that made ABBA dress the way they do. Maybe. After this. Up next is producer Vivian Lay. Hey, Viv. Hey, Roman. So, what do you have for us this year? So, what I wanted to do for my mini story this year um, is talk about the band. ABBA, (laughs) because it's been a very long, very difficult year, and ABBA brings me a lot of joy. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, did you have anything specific about ABBA, or did you just want to chat about ABBA for the next 10 minutes? (laughs) I would actually love to chat about ABBA and the Mamma Mia cinematic universe (laughs) and how much it rules, but I actually do have something specifically that I wanted to talk about, and that's ABBA's outfits. (laughs) Okay. Because I think it's pretty well documented that they consistently dressed in these outrageous stage costumes when performing. Yeah, they, they were not known for their subtlety. No. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm just going to give you a quick tour of some of ABBA's best looks so that we could be on the same page. So okay. I dropped in a photo, um, which is a lot. It's a it's it's a look. Ooh, oh, my God. Um, yeah, indeed. Yeah. So Frida, who's on the left, she's wearing a <laughs> snakeskin jumpsuit. Um, you've got mm-hmm. Benny mm-hmm. next door who's wearing like this blue blazer and his lapels are made out of a giant like ostrich plume. Um, yeah. But my favorite is Bjorn, who's on the very right. He's wearing a head to toe jumpsuit, blue, skin tight with a cape. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they kind of look like professional wrestlers or kind of like circus performers or maybe <laughs> circus performing professional wrestlers. Yes. You know? Like Bjorn <laughs> literally looks like he's about to be shot out of a cannon in this picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, it's so good. (laughs) I know. I love it so much. But like the reason why I want to talk about ABBA's fashion choices in particular um, is because I had read this really weird piece of trivia that, you know, if it's true, makes this the perfect mini story for me. (laughs) Okay. The reason why ABBA's outfits were like so out there and so wild was because according to Swedish tax law at the time, if you're a performer and your costumes were not suitable for everyday wear, they were tax deductible. (laughs) <laughs> that's so funny so so like so the point is is like if you're a musician and your stage clothes are are just too impractical for for everyday wear um to, to go you know to a, a birthday party or an ikea or, or something you could actually write them off like as costumes like they were they were professional wear yes yeah, okay. exactly um like so this had been picked up by a bunch of different websites um but it was reported that this particular tax law encouraged abba's costume designer to make their stage outfits you know as as flamboyant and essentially as unwearable as possible. Yeah. I mean, this actually kind of reminds me of uh, the fact that uh, bricks were taxed differently in England at different times. <laughs> and so you can sort of date how old a building is by the size of its bricks. So there's all kinds of things in the in the design world that are due to you know mundane tax considerations and not because of some grand design idea. But But it does make me think, you know, in the case of how flamboyant these costumes are and because it's ABBA and because it's the internet, <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like how much this is true versus how much this is just ABBA clickbait. Yeah, exactly. Because this is still disco music that they are dressing for. Exactly. And I got kind of hung up on this. Um, so I ended up calling somebody to find out. Yes, Vivian, I'm with you. Hi, you know, it was me. Um, is, is now still a good time to talk? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> um, nothing can take me away from you until death do us part. 
Oh, that's a charmer there, right there. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so who, who is this? So this is Uwe Sandström. My name is Uwe Sandström. I am, uh, well, among other things, the designer of the world-famous ABBA group from Sweden. Wow, so you, you, you went straight to the horse's mouth. This is the source. Yes, exactly. And I, I really wanted to talk to Uva, not just because he knows the answer to this tax question, um, but also because he might literally have the most fascinating career on the planet. I'm also a professor of science, teaching young people to become zookeepers and working with wildlife and endangered species. I'm actually also working as a safari guide in Kenya. I've been doing that for 25 years. <laughs> what? <laughs> he's a so he's a zoologist who leads safari tours in in Kenya, and also designed all the costumes for Apple. Yes, and he also <laughs> arranges flowers, um, and he owns a restaurant. But probably the thing that he's really known for now is his work with endangered animals. Um, he's actually mm-hmm. one of those television animal specialists who will bring like tarantulas and tortoises onto talk oh, yeah. shows. So he's basically yeah. like the Jack Hanna of Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> he actually started out his career wanting to work with endangered animals and just kind of fell into costume design. So how does one do that? How does one go from working with animals to ABBA? Well, that's also kind of a wonky story. <laughs> so mm-hmm. according to Uva, he was at university studying like zoology and botany and marine biology. You see, studying at the university was quite expensive, so I had to earn some money. And you see, believe it or not, but during a period of my young life, I was studying the art of flamenco. Wait, wait flamenco dancing? Is that what he said? Yes, flamenco dancing. <laughs> okay, so let's let's back up for people who just joined us. <laughs> He's a zoologist who leads safari tours in Africa. He designs costumes for ABBA and is also was a professional flamenco dancer. <laughs> yes, he's literally the most fascinating person on the planet. <laughs> So Uva told me that he basically started sewing because he and his fiance, you know, at the time they had this background in flamenco dancing. Um, and Uva figured that they could earn some extra money by performing at flamenco clubs. But there was this one problem, which was that his fiance said that she didn't have any flamenco dresses to perform in. And I said, that's not a problem, darling. I will make one for you. And of course she laughed. And she said, but you can't make flamenco dresses. Uwe, come on. It's quite complicated. And you see, you shouldn't say no to a person like me. So he ended up taking his mother's old dresses and then teaching himself how to make flamenco dresses. And he just ended up being like very naturally good at it. So the dresses that he was making for his fiance caught the eye of a local theater group in the area. So he, just, he started designing for them. Um, and then he started working with, you know, local musical artists making costumes for like musical performers. And that's how he ended up meeting Frida from ABBA. So she took her friends, three of them and herself, of course, to my studio. And I said, well, well, tell me, tell me, friends, I don't know anything about you. Well, I know you've been singing and who you are, but, but what do you want? And then Vivian, then Vivian, Bjorn said these words, remember them. Uwe, remember, nothing is too wild. I guarantee he did regret that many times. <laughs> So the first outfit that he ended up designing for ABBA as a group was for this video called Ring Ring. Those are actually the costumes from the picture that I showed you above where, you know, Frida's in the snakeskin jumpsuit and Bjorn's in that blue Mm -hmm. bodysuit with the cape. Uh, If if you look at it, you can see Bjorn. He looks like something between a circus artist, a drag show and um, Superman. He has a cape. He has this. He has this leotard, you know, with big sequences, enormous platform shoes. Well, he looks really crazy because you see, I was so fascinated by circus because I had some friends working with circus, and look at these outfits and costume, and you got a small circus company. <laughs> really, it was the first time that a pop group should be dressed with plumes and with sequences and leotards and everything. And that was the beginning. So what he's saying there is the reason why ABBA looked like they were straight out of the circus in that music video is because Uva was literally inspired by the circus. Yes, exactly. (laughs) It's a straight line. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> well, so I guess the big question is, is did the tax deduction incentive encourage Uva to make their outfits even more absurd? <laughs> well, that's a very funny story. It, it's, well, it is actually partly, partly true, but not concerning ABBA. But uh, can you imagine ABBA wearing these outfits when they're going shopping, singing honey, honey, you want to buy some honey, yes, I want salad. <laughs> <laughs> so he said that while he did purposefully make costumes more impractical for tax reasons for other musicians, that was never his goal when he was designing for ABBA. I had some artists who came to me because I made costumes for most of Swedish artists, really most of them, and some of them came can you please write me a paper to the tax authorities so you can convince them that this outfit is not suitable for wearing at a, at a funeral or a, at a dinner sitting or whatever. So it, that happened three or four times. So actually, it's partly true because there was a law, uh, and it still is a law in Sweden, but I can tell you it was never any part of any of the costumes that are designed and produced for the ABBA group. Never, ever. So now you've got the complete answer. So in the end, were ABBA's costumes tax deductible? I mean, probably because they were clearly oh, not... yeah. Yeah, like <laughs> seriously, like why not write them off? <laughs> They're not suitable for everyday use. Um, but that wasn't a factor in how Uwe designed for the group. Like, I know that the tax deduction story you know, makes for a good story, but I kind of like his answer better. I mean, it, you know, he didn't create these bonkers outfits for ABBA because he needed to. It's just because he wanted to, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, Uva was telling me that his inspiration came from everything, from, like, the animals that he worked with, to Swedish flowers, to his friends at the circus. Um, so what he created was really a reflection of his eclectic background. And he really does have an eclectic background. Right. What a fascinating man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Vivian. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Well, thank you for solving that mystery that I didn't know I actually needed solved. <laughs> <laughs> it was my pleasure. Um, I did want to to give a quick thank you to the ABBA Museum in Stockholm for connecting me with Uva. Oh, that's great. Well, and thanks to Uva, because yes. that's probably the most interesting man we've had on our show. He's the most fascinating person I've ever <laughs> talked to in my life. <laughs> Thank you, Uva. I, I, I love it. Thanks. Thank you. If we don't hear from each other, a merry, merry, merry Christmas and a happy new year. Or as we say within the family, happy new year, happy new year, <laughs> as we say. Bye-bye, Vivian. going to be hearing more mini stories from the rest of the 99pi crew as the first two episodes of 2021. Happy New Year. As of the end of 2020, 99% Invisible is Katie Mingle, Kurt Kolstad, Delaney Hall, Emmett Fitzgerald, Sean Rial, Joe Rosenberg, Vivian Lay, Sophia Klatsker, Chris Berube, Abby Madon, Christopher Johnson, and me, Roman Mars. We are a project of 91.7 KALW in San Francisco and produced on Radio Row in beautiful downtown Oakland, California. We are a member of Radiotopia from PRX, a collective of the best, most innovative shows in all of podcasting. Discover, listen, and support them all at radiotopia.fm. You can find us and join discussions about the show on Facebook. You can tweet at me at Roman Mars and the show at 99pi.org. We're on Instagram and Reddit too. I bet you can still buy a last minute copy of the 99% Invisible City just in time for Christmas if you act right now. Get it at your local bookstore or by going to 99pi.org book. 
I know that your daily habits have changed a lot this year, and for the people who have stayed with us listening from week to week, I thank you. I am grateful, and I do hope you keep coming back. There is so much more good stuff in 2021. I cannot wait. Keep in touch at 99pi.org. Radio Topia from Pete.